What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Got a brother on today, spent a bunch of time in prison. He ends up getting out. He's got his own, you know, coaching system going on. He's going to tell you about that. We'll plug all his links. But his brother's from California, West Coast. But I cannot tell Brett's story better than Brett can. Brett, tell the people who are who you are, where you're from, and let's talk about you. Yeah. Hey, Chad, first and foremost, man, I'm stoked to be on the show. You know, I got plugged in with somebody that you work with. I've also had uh, buddies that I was in prison with that have been on the show. And even when I started my YouTube channel, some of the first comments people were saying was like, bro, you need to link up with Chad of Blood on the Razor Wire. So, man, it's an honor and a privilege to connect with you. But yeah, my name is Brett Booker. I got 138 months in federal prison and I earned every single month of that sentence. It was ended, it ended up being two federal sentences, one for 51 months and one 87 months. And I'll explain how all of that happened. So I grew up in California. Around the time that I was in middle school, I moved to Nebraska. And it was a real culture shock, like growing up in California and coming out to Nebraska. It was like a totally different way of life. And when I was 14 years old, that's when I really first started smoking weed. And I'm a testament, dude, a great example that if you're not intentional, with your actions and your thoughts, dude, you're going to snowball and become someone you don't recognize. So at 14, I reached a point where I'm like, man, I don't want to like pay for this weed anymore. Like I'm going to start selling it. So at the time, you know, just to give you some context, you know, I grew up in the suburbs. My family was upper middle class, but we did have a lot of addiction. We did have uh, a lot of dysfunction in our family. And just because a family has money doesn't mean it's going to be completely stable. You still need that strong you know, nuclear family component. We didn't have that, you know? So I started selling weed. And when I first started selling weed, I'm not going to lie. I just went to my dad's desk. I pulled out his checkbook. I think I wrote myself a check for like $2,000 cash it at the bank. And he was so busy with his work. He never even noticed I did it. I pulled out the cash. I bought a pound of weed and I was off to the races. I was still connected with people in California that were willing to send me out packs. And I started it, but at this time I still wasn't even old enough to drive. So I literally pay people like a few hundred dollars a day to drive me all around town and deliver packs. Um, this lasted for about a year or two. And around 2011, the Silk Road came out, which was a dark net marketplace, right? Bitcoin was still brand new, it was just a few years old. And I remember like learning about, it. I'm like, man, this shit is cool. So my very first order that I did was I was ordering fake IDs. So that became an entire little side hustle. Like everybody wanted to go drink in high school. Everybody wanted to be able to buy alcohol. So I would order the Ohio IDs. They were scannable. They had the holograms. I'd buy them for like $50. I would sell them for, sell them for like $250. And I was running it up. And then people started asking me for other stuff. So they'd be like, hey, man, like, can I get some Molly? So I go on the Silk Road. And what's crazy is you're connected instantly to, you know, the biggest wholesalers and manufacturers of drugs all across the world. And I'm a teenager. So I'm like, well, damn, I could buy a kilo for a thousand dollars. Like run it up. Let me get three of those joints, you know? And that, that broke down to like, uh, you know, a dollar a gram. So you for a minute, I didn't know that you were connected to the Silk Road thing. This thing might be bigger than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So it's crazy. I'm like, dude, it's a dollar a gram. Like I could wholesale it for $30 a gram. People are buying it for a, like a uh, hundred dollars a gram. They're buying it for $10 a point. Like I'm like, run it up. So I get these kilos and it just sells out so fast. And I don't even give a fuck because I barely sell an ounce of it and I already profited. So then I started getting into, I'm like, what else can I make money on? And I'm like, damn, these hand pressed Xanax bars look interesting. You know, we call them super bars. They could put four milligrams of uh, Elazapram powder in a regular bar. So I'm like super bars, you know, they would dye them white, yellow, and green. I'd put them in a party pack. And that got so out of control that I started to have to, I had to weigh the pills by the pound because it was just too many pills to fucking count. And I'd vacuum seal them. And then there reached a point where I was just, I ran out of people to sell to in my city. I mean, I was still selling and putting on, you know, damn near everybody in Omaha, Nebraska, but I'm like, I want to do this bigger. So I even opened up a vendor account on Silk Road and I would just order everything internationally. I'd break it down. I'd work on my stealth mechanisms and just start, I started selling everything I could think of, you know, dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is the main chemical that makes you dream, which is a psychedelic, LSD, research chemicals like 25i, NBOME, hand pressed Xanax bars, Molly, just everything. And I was still selling packs. So 
all during this time, like I was still getting in trouble. Like I caught my first case at 15. It was just a possession of a bong, right? So they put me on uh, like probation for that. A little bit after that, I was acting up kind of crazy. I got caught breaking into 200 cars. So they put me on felony diversion. Now, all during this time, I was still doing my Silk Road stuff. I was still doing the dark net stuff. And I ended up getting kicked out of high school early, which is kind of interesting because I never brought anything to school. Never. Like that was my, that was my whole MO. I'm going to go to school. Never going to bring a cell phone. Never going to bring any drugs. And, you know, the principal just had it out for me. So I remember like early on in my senior year, they pulled me out of the seventh hour class. They searched my car. They didn't find anything. They go back. They find a pair of scissors and they swab it. And apparently it tested positive for THC. So he's like, we're going to suspend you for two weeks uh, pending expulsion. And I go back with my dad a week later and he's talking mad shit. He's like, we, we have all these students telling us that you're selling all these drugs, to all these people. I said, man, fuck you. I'm not doing shit. You're not a, you're not the police. Like, what are you doing? I have good grades. What are you doing? So they ended up just giving me my degree. So I graduated high school about six months early. Right. And at this point in time, I uh, was selling weed to uh, Lee Terry's son, who was the congressman of uh, Nebraska, right? So he's like, hey, I know you got free time. Like, you could work for my dad on the Blue Crew, which is like a, a political organization trying to get people to vote for him. So, you know, I was still trapping. I was still doing my thing, but I was working for the Blue Crew. And it actually went really well. Like, I was, I was, I was vibing really well with the congressman. We had a trip planned to uh, Washington, D.C. And I remember there was another kid that I was making phone calls with and he kind of knew what kind of time I was on. And he went to the congressman and he's like, hey, Brett Booker, man, he, he sells a lot of drugs. Like, you, we can't have him on the team. So Lee Terry pulls me to the side and he's like, Brett, are you selling drugs? And my first thought is like, this is a congressman. Like, you can't lie to this guy. So I just say, yeah, of course. Like, I sell some weed and stuff. And, and he's like, we can't have you selling weed and you working for me on my political team. Like you can't be on the blue, get out of here, you know? So we parted ways and I don't know if that's what started all of this. I do have an idea cause I've looked at all my paperwork, but I still don't think that Lee Terry uh, dimed me out or reported me because there's no mention of it in the paperwork other than my sentencing transcripts. When the judge used it as a character statement, when they said Brett Booker, was selling drugs as he was working for our congressman. And, you know, I thought it was funny. So at this time, I transitioned to uh, the university. Around this time, the Silk Road went down. This was in, uh, I believe, 2013. But the Silk Road was only down for like, you know, two hours and Silk Road 2.0 came out. So I lost a lot of Bitcoin that was stuck in that wallet. But I'm like, OK, boom, open up another account on Silk Road 2.0. Let me stop you for a minute, Brett, right? Because it seems yeah. like, man, you're kind of like that white kid that all the other white kids are getting stuff from. You know, you're on Silk Road. Yeah. You really know what's going on, but you're that dude. What's the money like for you, though? I mean, are you living living your best life? Are you making real money? Or is it just what yeah. you think is real money? Insane money. But the thing is, I was just like, a lot of my money, I was just throwing it all into Bitcoin, all into Bitcoin, all into Bitcoin. And it's not because, like, this giant wave that happened that I thought Bitcoin was going to be, like, a great investment. When I was in prison and I saw the price skyrocketed and I realized that if I didn't go to prison, I'd be worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Like real shit. When, when I look at how much Bitcoin I had, I just looked at it as like, hey, we use cryptocurrency to sell drugs. We use cryptocurrency to commit cyber crime. And I could put all of this money on a USB stick, hide it in my counter instead of having a safe with all this cash in it. So I would still keep cash and it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for me to be rolling around with a hundred thousand, a hundred bands in a duffel bag. You know, like I'd get into arguments with homies. They would try to act like they're bigger than me. Cause I was scrawny as fuck. I was a little ass white boy. And I'd be like, bitch, I carry a hundred grand on me. What's up? And friends to this day still mention that they're like, dude, you were cocky as fuck. And that's what it was. So yeah, man, I started putting on all the universities. That was like my next move when I went to college I went to the University of Nebraska at Omaha because I was still on probation. And then I would just make trips out to different universities in the Midwest. I would pretty much 
go to different frat parties. And you know, the frat boys, they would try to kick you out. I'm like, hold up, hold up. And I'd pretty much be trying to make my move. I'll be like, Hey man, I'm going to come out here or I'll send my driver out here like every other week. You know, I'll bring you the LSD, the weed, the Xanax, the Molly, and it's all on front. All you got to do is just be a man of your word, sell the work. I'll come up, pick up the cash and give you more. So I started like developing little cells of uh, frat boys that were selling for me, which a lot of drama came out of this because a lot of them just were dirt bags and I had to do things I didn't want to do. And that comes with the street life. But well, I'm hold at, on now. you did some things you didn't want to do. What are you talking about? You had to put your hands on these cats. Yeah, man. Like there was periods of time when all this was going on that I started popping a lot of Xanax. And the thing about Xanax is I call it the, I don't give a fuck about anything drug. Like, and I really try to drive the point home that I was scrawny as hell, but I was wild as fuck. I just didn't give a fuck. Like I'd pull my gun out. If we're going to get in a shootout, fuck it. I would, if you owe me money, I'll throw a Molotov at your car. Like it still blows my mind. It's why I have so much gratitude right now for life. Cause I feel like I shouldn't be alive. All the risks that I took, like it's insane. So I'll share a quick story on that. Uh, this was in the future. This was in between my two federal indictments, but there was a frat kid. He only owed me like 20 bands, right? I would have let him keep the money because he was in a hard time. But what pissed me off was I went to high school with him and he blocked my number. He blocked me on social media. And the fact that he's going to throw a friendship away for 20,000 is what pissed me off more than anything else. So I went with a friend and we were parked out of the frat house. We had zip ties, duct tape, a fucking like machete, tasers, pepper spray. Like I was so high. I was just like, man, I'm going to need all this gear. And uh, we're waiting outside of there. I'm smoking a blunt, right? <clears throat> and I'm just waiting for him to come out of the frat house. And my thing is, I'm just going to go up to him, tase him, wait for him to drop, tie him up, throw him in my trunk, do all this crazy shit. And dude, God, God works in mysterious ways because he did not allow this to happen. So I'm smoking the blunt and then I see police sirens behind me. So my first thing I do is my sunroof is open. So I just take the blunt. I flick it out the sunroof. It goes out the way I kept osium. So like I kept my hand down in the middle of my lap and I just osium the fuck out of everything. The uh, police officer knocks on the window. I grab my vape right away. Just my nicotine vape. And then I open up the door slowly. I say, officer, do you mind if I step out of the car? I've been sitting here for a while. She's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Come out. And the whole strategy was to not let her smell anything inside the car or see anything on the back seat. So I step out and she's like, hey, we have a report of somebody smoking weed out here. I said, no, officer, you know, us youngsters, this whole new wave came out with these e-cigs. I know it's probably not the healthiest thing for us, but you can see it right here. And then I showed her a big cloud. She's like, oh, that's it. I'm like, yeah, officer. She's like, well, I just need to run your name real quick. I said, no problem. Here's my ID. If you need anything else, let me know. She runs it. I guess she didn't, like my probation had to have popped up, but she didn't say anything. Uh, well, it was actually my federal pretrial release. So, which we'll get to, but she comes back. She's like, all right, you're free to go. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Like if, and then at this time, that kid walked out the frat house and he left, dude, I got in my car. I drove back to Omaha because this was in Lincoln, Nebraska, at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And I was pissed off at myself because it all just hit me kind of like right then and there. I'm like, dude, I was about to kidnap this guy. I was about to throw him in my trunk and do him some stupid shit over 20 grand. Like, thank God this officer stepped in and it didn't lead to anything. So there was instances like that that happened that just came as a result of popping a lot of Xanax. So let's rewind a bit. I'm at, uh, I'm in between probations. I get caught at the university of Nebraska at Omaha sending, uh, sh uh, throwing 20 pounds of weed out my window. Uh, I picked up this chick from a party, right? And I wanted to fuck her, but first she wanted to get high. So we roll up a blunt. I'm smoking in the dorm room. The, uh, I, f I think they called an RA, like it's a student that kind of runs the floor. Long story short, he calls the cops. I freak out. I throw 20 pounds out of weed out the window. They arrest me. I was on federal diversion for breaking into all those cars when I was a teenager. Right. So I go to jail for a stop. bit. Let me stop you. You're talking about federal diversion. It was a federal case breaking into cars. No, sorry. Uh, I said felony diversion. Yeah. So that was felony diversion. So essentially this is how it broke down. So just cause I know I've been all over the place. 
When I was 15, I got arrested for a possession charge. At like 16, I got caught breaking into like 200 cars. They put me on felony diversion. At 18, I got caught throwing 20 pounds of weed out the window of my dorm room. They put me on young adult court. Okay. While I'm on young adult court, never stopped ever. At 19, the feds start watching me. At 20, two months after they dropped my felony charges to misdemeanor charges because I completed the young adult um, court program, the DEA kicked in my door. And this was in 2014. And they kicked in my door and they were primarily there for the research chemicals that I was selling. They were building a case on me for the research chemicals. The feds in Oakland, California also had me on transcripts because of deals that I was doing in Oakland, California with hand pressed Xanax bars uh, with a guy named the Xanax King uh, out of Oakland. And he had oil drums just filled with Xanax bars. And they never indicted me out of California. And it was probably because of all that. So what happens is, and this is important, is like in 2014, I get arrested by the DEA. I had nothing in my house but cash. So they confiscate the cash. They say, hey, can we search your art gallery? So downtown, I was running like a fake business where I was doing web design, graphic design. And it was on the top floor of like a, a luxury art gallery. And I had the space was pimped out. I had all this dope like art on the wall, a nice office, couches. Like it was a good vibe. I just went there just to chill and uh, make it look like I was doing something when I was on young adult court, you know, because they had to, you had to prove you had a job. So I was like, yeah, I own a business. And they searched the art gallery. What I didn't know was that somebody that I was uh, selling to, he was one of the few people that I was still selling to in real life and not on the Silk Road. He had like 10 controlled buys on him. I didn't even know the feds did that many controlled buys. Cause when I looked at my paperwork, I'm like, like one, two, three is okay. But like, like 10, I'm like, what the fuck? And what they did was they were putting trackers on his car, tracking it. And I knew the feds were coming because one of my last meetings for young adult court is the probation office is connected to the County jail. So I pull up and I was on some bullshit. I was smoking a blunt on my way down to check in with probation, you know, just never gave a fuck. And I always kept a glove in my pants of fake pee because anytime they wanted to drug test me, I would just pinch it real quick, squeeze into the cup. I put cologne on. I go up into probation. It's flawless. I, you know, I tell them I'm well spoken. I'm articulate. So I tell them how great everything is going. I take my UA. I, I entered out into the jail parking lot. One of the guys in work release that is in the parking lot. He's like, Hey bro, is that your car? And I'm like, yeah, that's my car. What's up? He's like, is that your car? I said, bro, what, what do you want? He's like, I just saw a van pull up and they put a tracker underneath your car. I said, nah, no way. He's like, dude, I'm trying to save you and your people. I said, dude, is this cap? He's like, it's not cap. I said, okay. I pulled out a few hundred dollar bills. I said, good looking out, bro. Like good luck with the rest of your sentence. I drive to the art gallery. I take all of my cell phones. I make one phone call. I said, hey, bro, meet me out at the river. And I snap all my phones. I put them in a bag. I meet them out at the river. And my first thought is like, you know, they'll, they probably put it underneath the engine block or something, right? So I'm looking underneath the engine block and I don't find anything. So I'm like, dude, is this, did this guy get over on me? Is he tripping? Like, so then I go underneath the trunk and I look up and I'm like, oh, damn. The battery was like this big with three big magnets. And then there was a cord and then like a big radio device. It kind of looks like a radio that a cop would talk into with a giant antenna with one magnet. So I pull it off and I'm like, what the fuck? So my first thought is let's just smash it and throw it in the river. So as I'm getting ready to do that, I look across the way and there's a bunch of semi trucks in the park parking lot across the street. I said, you know what? It'd be funny to put this on a semi truck. Like let's fuck with these people. So I drive across the street. We put it on a semi truck and uh, I knew someone was watching me. I didn't even know who the feds were at the time. You know, I was just turned, I was 19, just about to turn 20. And I just knew people were watching me, but I was in the mindset of like, fuck them. They're not going to get me. Like I'm going to outsmart them. So, you know, fast forward, they search the art gallery, this guy that was doing these controlled buys, uh, he stashed, I can't remember the exact number. I think it was like 10,000 doses of research chems. 
So they find that in the art gallery and, you know, I was hit because it was in my name. And so they take me to jail. So that was my very first federal case. So I'm in jail at this point in time. I've never been convicted of a felony. I've caught felonies, but they all dropped into misdemeanors through the programs that I was doing, you know, probation, felony diversion, young adult court, now a fed case at 20 years old. So at the time, the drug that they caught me with was very newly legal. Like, I don't remember all the intricacies of it, but my lawyer explained it to me that like the DEA has the congressional authority to make certain substances illegal for a two year period until Congress can schedule it. And you probably know way more about this than I do, but they have to go through like a 10 step process. They make these drugs illegal and then they can arrest you. And this all started because of all the K2s and the designer drugs. So now they can use this law and apply that to just about anything, right? So I can't remember what my original guidelines were, but I think the top of it was probably anywhere from like two to four years, right? So I wasn't looking at a whole lot of time. And after I was in county jail for about three months, they offered me pretrial release, right? So the conditions of the pretrial release was they said like, look, we don't really trust you. You got to go to the federal halfway house for probably three months. Then you got to go to a sober living house. So I go to the halfway house and a lot of the guys that were at the halfway house, they saw me on the news. So they kind of had an idea of what my case was about and who I was. And a lot of these guys were a lot more hardened than me. You know, a lot of them just did 15, 20, 30 years. Right. And Many of them were already hitting me up. They were like, Booker, man, I saw you on the news. Like, can you put me on? And at first I'm like, no, no, no. But over time, my barrier broke down. And I don't know if it's because they say the male mind doesn't mature till you're 25 or what it might be. But I started putting guys on in the halfway house. And even though I faced this federal case, I thought I was going to get away with it. Right. And I had no track record to even think that was true, but that's what I did. So I ended up going to the sober living house and the guys at the sober living house were kind of uh, tripping on me. So I kind of created some drama. I got the president kicked out and I convinced the guys to vote me as president. So now I was running the sober living house. I had more control over my life and I was staying sober. You were on some big brother shit. Eliminate the vote them out. <laughs> That's what it was, man, because the guys, I'm just a people person. So I invested a lot of time into building the relationships with the guys that were there. I started to pit all the other guys against the president. As soon as he slipped up one time, we kicked him out. They were like, Booker, you're a good leader. We'll make you president. And then I was able to set my uh, own rules for how I wanted to operate. Right. So I'm in the sober living house. I still haven't gotten high. I was really proud of that because I was a crackhead for weed. And things were going decently well. Like I felt like my shit was on point. I was actually selling drugs the right way where you're sober, you got your good stash spots, but there was a few things in my life that happened that kind of threw me off. You know, I had a best friend who committed suicide and I didn't really know how to process uh, all of that. And my old coping mechanisms were drugs. And then I had another friend who uh, was murdered in a bad drug deal, another friend that overdosed. And at the time, I just did not have the right coping mechanisms. So I started using drugs again. And as soon as I started using drugs again, Chad is crazy. I'm facing this federal case. I just stopped reporting to pre-trial release. Stop reporting. I stopped calling the UA hotline, said, fuck it. I went into full trap mode and... <laughs> On Thanksgiving Eve of 2015, that's when it just, it all ended. So I was at a restaurant with uh, a friend of mine. I was celebrating his sobriety, which is so fucking stupid to think that I'm such a good influence. I can celebrate your sobriety. And I was trying to do too many things at once. Like right prior to this, I realized how fucked up my decisions were. I'm like, my lawyer kept calling me and he's like, bro, just turn yourself in. Like you're making the situation way worse. If you get caught with anything, you are fucked. Like just turn yourself in. So I was like, okay. So I put everything in my trunk of my car. I was going to drive it to the storage unit, throw it in the storage unit, not think about it again, turn myself in. So 
but I was trying to do too many things at once. So I have everything in my car. I pick up my friend to celebrate his birthday. This girl texts me who owed me some money. I didn't know that she was working with the feds and she comes in. I'll never forget it. Like I'm in the restaurant. The waitress asked for my ID. I have a fat wad of cash and I give her my ID. And then she's not even like trying to flirt with me or anything. I'm like, cause this was at twin peaks. It's like the Hooters of the Midwest. I'm like, you're not trying to flirt with me. The, the restaurant was mostly empty. And I'm thinking why there was a group of guys that were kind of me mugging me right next to me. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And then all the waitresses kept going to this guy in the corner that was on his laptop. And he kept looking at me and typing, looking at me and typing. The vibe was so off. I'm like, dude, something is not right. So I end up walking out of the restaurant. As soon as I walk out, you know, squad car, squad car, squad car, or police car, police car. They come out with their ARs. Brett Booker, get on the fucking ground. And at that point in time, dude, I knew my life was over. I knew that I just turned you know, a somewhat serious Fed case into a super serious Fed case because I'm just a complete dumbass who didn't give a fuck about anything. Let's talk and about, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Now you got this Fed case, the second one, <clears throat> eventually you plead guilty, right? You go in front of the judge, the judge gives you what, 138 months? Yeah, so this is exactly what happened. So they just gave me the top, I agreed. I did an 11C1C plea agreement. And I agreed to the top of the guidelines on both cases. So for just the research chemicals, it was 51 months for the, all the stuff they found in my trunk, which was like a Beretta nine millimeter extended clip, some Xanax and some weed and some stuff that was 87 months. So they gave me a 924 G a drug user in possession of a firearm. And then I can't remember if the extended magazine was an enhancement or I can't remember the exact how it, it worked out, but essentially it was 138 months aggregate where they gave me 51 months, 87 months, ran it back to back. For those that don't know, what's that, 11.3, 11 years, three months, something like that? Uh, yeah, 11 and a half. 11, so years, 11 and a half years, you've only been alive for 20, so that's like a little more than half of how long you've been on Earth. What's it right. like for a 20-year-old to end up with 11 and a half years? Dude, I was actually so hopeless. Like, I'll never forget, I couldn't conceptualize what doing a decade in prison would look like. Like... You know, that's why a lot of people get depressed is because you're, you're feeling so low. You're feeling so negative. You see no light at the end of the tunnel. It was the same thing. I'm like, damn, you know, I don't even know how I'm going to do this. But at the same time, as soon as I got to the first prison yard, I was at uh, Leavenworth in Kansas and I met other guys like they asked me, how long was my sentence? I said 138 months. They said, oh, that's nothing. I said, that's nothing. What do you mean? That's nothing. They're like, well, this guy's doing 20. This guy's doing 30. He's doing 30. He's doing life. And real quick, I was humbled right then and there. I said, bro, you know what? I'm never going to complain about my sentence. I'm not going to be one of those dudes at all. I'm just going to make the most of every single fucking day because there are guys who did a fraction of what I did. And because of their criminal history, because of the conspiracy charge, I didn't have conspiracy charges. I had possession with intent to deliver. So because of conspiracy laws, criminal history and other factors, they got fucked and they probably did way less than I did. What was Leavenworth like? I mean, it used to be a USP. Um, you know, a lot of FCIs are kind of watered down, but Leavenworth still had a little bit of a reputation, right? Yeah, you know, to my understanding, people said that they still ran it like a penitentiary. Now, obviously not to the fullest extent because a lot of those guys left, but a lot of the people that were at Leavenworth for a decade or more, they had the opportunity to stay there. So a lot of people that were still on the bullshit, they loved Leavenworth because the guards didn't care about people making wine. They didn't care that people had their elaborate moonshine setups. They didn't care about the K2. People were pimping out their cells. Like if you had money, you could buy your own cell and then you could get all new tile. You could get new lockers, a real mirror, like wood engravings here and there, build a speaker in there. And it was popping. People did play the politics and uh, they they did read paperwork and all of that shit was was serious. And um, the guards didn't care about people getting tattoos. Like, that's why a lot of people like Leavenworth. And when they had the opportunity to go to the low, they actually didn't want to leave just because it was like a free for all, especially B Upper, which they used to call the Thunderdome, you know, which is like four uh, tiers tall. There's so many cuts here and there. There's all these people cooking honey buns in their uh, air in the fryer with the stinger and the oil. So yeah, Leavenworth was an experience, man. There was always something going on because it was just such an old prison and just anything went. 
Let me ask you this, you know, going in there young, and I know that they still have cars over there when you were there. I don't know if it's still that way, but yeah. there are people that have to put in work. You ever end up involved in anything in there? Yeah, to, to an extent, you know, it, it's one of those things where you have to do it when it's your turn, when you first get there. So, you know, my, my experience with that, with that was when I first got there was an individual who had the keys for the block and they kept telling him to stop using K2, stop using K2, stop using K2. And he just, he wouldn't. And it was bringing too much heat onto everybody. Cause he was one of those people that have those major episodes. Like he'd be in the chow hall at the turnstile and he would just freeze. He'd be in the unit screaming. And you know what it is like when people are bringing that much heat and people, someone's trying to cook off some wine into some moonshine or they're tattooing. When you have somebody out there and they're getting all the cops attention, people get pissed off about it. So he had to get run up top. That was about the first amount of work that I put in. And yeah, it's just one of those things, but especially with Leavenworth, there's always people that are volunteering to do it. Cause some people want to crash out. Some people they've run up a lot of bills. They're like, you know what? I need to go hit another yard. I'm just going to crash out. But what's funny is they'll try to crash out. Leavenworth just the staff just didn't care. They'll put you in the shoe for three days and send you right back to the yard. <laughs> Let me ask you this, so, you know, so people know the whole K two thing became a, a pandemic, an epidemic, a pandemic. It became all. Oh, for sure. This guy's the shot caller because he's got the keys for the unit for the white dudes, and he's running around. He's in the middle of the day, rah, running around yeah. screaming. And when you say episodes or epis, that's what these people are doing in prison. They're just going. I've seen dudes break down, cry, dudes scream. I've seen dudes, you know, getting the the move on. It's just, it's absolutely outrageous, right? Dude, it, it's it's a disgrace because it goes against everything about how a true wood, a true white boy, a true man should be in prison. And that's you stay fucking sober, you work out, you work on yourself, you mind your own fucking business, you got clean paperwork, like you just be a solid motherfucker. And a lot of those parallels bring out to the real world of what it means to be like a real man. Like a lot of people don't think they can pull lessons out of prison, but you absolutely can. The people that conduct themselves at the highest level in prison do really well out here in the streets because they wake up early. They're fucking disciplined. No matter what hits them, they do not break. And with this guy, yeah, it was totally unacceptable. You're making all of us look bad. And that's another thing. We do not want to be look. We don't want to look bad. We don't want to look weak because shit gets serious. Like we almost had a riot when I was there with the uh, Serenios over another kid that did some stupid shit in our car. And, you know, we were putting the magazines around our chest for body armor, just in case, you know, the, the Serenios were going to stab us or whatever it would be. But as soon as the lockdown came out, the agreement was he was just going to, the kid was just going to get his ass beat, run off the yard. And that's how we, we solved that problem. But it, yeah, the shit's serious. The shot caller in your unit, he had to go up top. Did you have to put your hands on him? Yeah. And after, the, after, that incident, after that incident, they gave me the cell and it was a dope ass cell. So, I mean, I came up because the cell was dope. It had a, a, a spot right there, right in front of the TV. So at nighttime in lockdown, I had my own TV, my own remote. So it, it definitely was worth it. Well, you're, it was worth it, but you're jumping on this dude. Is he fighting back? Is he yelling, screaming? All of the above. All of the above, man. But they they almost know that it's coming. And with him, I went in with another guy because that's the thing when you run them up top. We're never going to come alone. We're not going to allow you to win. You know, you're going to come two or three deep. And it doesn't matter how good of a fighter you are. The cells are tiny. You're going to lose. And some people that do know that it's coming ahead of time, like I've seen some people, they'll put their lock on a belt and they'll be waiting in their cell, swinging it. And I remember my cell, he had to run someone up top. And it was the same thing. The guy was in his cell with his locks, just like, come get it, motherfuckers. And my cell, he grabbed the plastic chair and he ran in with the chair like it was a battering ram. And somehow he didn't get touched. But the guy he went with did get his uh, wig split a bit. But right, yeah. you're out living your best life now. How long you been home? Yeah, dude, I've been home about five and a half months. And dude, I, I look at my whole life as extra credit because of Trump and the First Step Act. I was able to capitalize on 13 months of halfway house slash home confinement. So that's why, you know, I still got the uh, GPS bracelet on my leg. And dude, it's all fucking gratitude because, you know, right when I got out, I uploaded a video of me walking out of the gate of uh, FCI Sandstone. And I'm going to pull it up right here because, dude, it always brings a smile to my face that, you know, this video 
has uh, 63,000 likes. It got about 4,000 views. And it was my very first post, no hashtags, no nothing. And from there, I just started growing my page. I started making content on mindset, fitness, nutrition. I launched a life coaching business. And dude, it's been so rewarding to give people the same tools, the same strategies that gave me an unbreakable fucking mindset in prison and help them drop the fucking vices, eradicate the depression, eradicate the anxiety, because everybody out here is suffering. And a lot of people are suffering in silence and that doesn't have to be the case. So it's just crazy to think, you know, five months ago, I was uh, walking to the gym. I was riding the bus in Garden Grove, California, which is not a very nice spot in uh, Orange County. Now I'm in Laguna Niguel, beautiful part of Orange County. I go to a killer gym. I'm making good money, like, and I'm changing and impacting thousands of lives every single day. So it's rewarding. So tell the people where they can find you before we get ready to go. Yeah, you can find me um, on Instagram at it's Brett Booker, I-T-S, Brett Booker, B-R-E-T-T-B-O-O-K-E-R, on YouTube at Brett Booker. And then, yeah, mostly Instagram. People can connect me with Instagram. You can send me a DM. I respond to all of my DMs, no matter what time of day it is. I love to engage with people, offer feedback, see where I can help. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on. Before we get ready to go, anything else you want to say? Yeah, man. I just wanted to say, Chad, dude, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to connect with you. And for everybody that's watching, just know that I know you're watching this for entertainment reasons, but also there's a good chance that you are suffering, that you're going through some shit because life is fucking hard. So just remember, you know, Chad's a testament to this. I'm an example of this. You're never going to be fucking defined by what happens to you in life. No one really cares about that. If you look at top people, they don't care, but everybody's going to watch you when you're going through these hard times, you're going to be defined by how you choose to respond. So do not be that person that breaks. Do not be that person that when they get hit with hard times, they go drink, they go smoke, they do all the fucking bullshit. Like learn from us and our mistakes and like live your life right because prison fucking sucks. Listen, man, I definitely appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, sharing your experiences. Your links will be in the bio. People can go check you out. If you need a coach, this is the guy. He's doing big things. We appreciate you coming on, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out.